Chapter 12 of The Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What I wish to bring out particularly does not concern the enrichment of botanical and zoological knowledge, greatly important as I regard this, but rather the enlarging and liberalizing influences which nature has on the public mind generally. Dr. William E. Ritter Chapter 12 A Day with a Nature Guide One morning, six variously attired people, four men and two women, started from a hotel in the Rocky Mountain National Park with a nature guide. An auto whirled them to the end of the road far up the mountainside from whence they continued afoot. They were bound for one of the eternal snowdrifts on Long's Peak. The essence of nature guiding is to travel gracefully rather than to arrive. This guide tactfully put two or three at ease by convincing them that in the United States the belief in ferocious animals is a superstition, and no one, he continued, in this locality has ever been attacked by a wild animal. The day was perfect, but so interestingly did the guide describe experiences in storms that everyone hoped to be rain in the face before evening. The guide was jollied for being silent. These people, true to the customs of the day, asked for rubberneck specialties and demanded where the megaphone artist was. They were climbing in a V-shaped canyon traveling west. Presently, the guide pointed out that the right or north wall rises steeply in the sun and is covered with a scattered growth of stocky, long-armed pines. The left or south wall, which faces north, has a crowded growth of short-armed, tall spruces. In the bottom of the canyon, between these closely approaching, but unlike forests, is a lively stream with a few accompanying firs, willows, and flowers. Each member of the party remembered something of plant distribution, and each contributed something to the discussion concerning plant zones, slope exposure, temperature, and moisture, the determinism of ecological influences. When the scraps of information ceased, the guide added that each canyon wall also had its special kind of insect and mammal life, and that each of these tree species had its peculiar insect enemies and its bird and animal neighbors. Then, too, each individual bird and animal, every pair or flock, claimed a small bit of territory and commonly lived closely within this, likewise insisting on neighbors keeping within their own reservation. The nature guide is at his best when he discusses facts so that they appeal to the imagination and to the reason, gives flesh and blood to cold facts, makes life stories of inanimate objects. He deals with principles rather than isolated information, gives biographies rather than classifications. People are out for recreation and need restful intellectual visions and not dull, dry facts, rules, and manuals. What the guide says is essentially nature literature rather than encyclopedia natural history. This party, being interested in the distribution of plant and animal life and in erosion, the guide made these the features of the day's excursions. In a mountain region, widely varying life zones are seen side by side and two or three types of erosion may, in places, be seen from one viewpoint. The wear and tear on the earth's surface by many forces stand out unmistakably. All that the guide said concerning erosion could be set down under the heading The Biography of a Canyon. The various forces of erosion, running water, frost, ice, and acid, each at work in its respective place, with distinctive tools, were prying, wedging, cutting the canyon wider and deeper. Roots wedged the rocks and dissolved them with acids. 
but at the same time helped also to resist those tireless forces placing a binding holding network of fibers gravity handled the transportation of dislodged material each species of plant and animal is of orderly distribution and is found in the places that furnish it the necessities of life on the middle slopes of the rocky mountains are trees flowers and animals that are not found a thousand feet further up the slopes nor down the slopes a thousand feet in the foothills the guide's discussion was the autobiography of each species the story of my life or how i came to be where i am and what i am in this each plant and animal gave its adventures its customs its home territory its climatic zone and all the endless and insistent play of the radical and romantic forces of evolution environment and ecology a few popular and scientific names of species were learned but the guide was reticent about giving classifications his chief aim was to arouse a permanent interest in nature's ways and this by illuminating big principles climbing silently out of the canyon up a moderate slope just under timberline this party halted among the trees for a few minutes on the edge of a small grassy opening a deer and her two spotted fawns walked out into view then went across into the woods all turned aside and followed a porcupine that was lumbering across the opening ignoring their presence the guide remarked that there may have been a time when the porcupine threw its quills standing up and hurling them he imagined like a primitive man a spear but that the present development of this animal would prevent the quills from being thrown more than three or four inches however the other woods fellows make it their business to keep out of his way he has long been known as the stupidest fellow in the woods he is the only one who never appears to play he has no interest in natural history in nature guides nor in the world being so well shielded and having an inexhaustible food supply in the boundless forests he has not developed his wit up and on the party went except a man and woman who lingered to watch porky in the edge of the woods the guide stopped to wait for the stragglers but plainly panic-stricken at being separated from the party they were just disappearing in the woods headed north asking the others not to stir until he returned the guide dashed after them on reuniting the party the guide discussed the necessity of staying together most people he said are easily confused and lose their direction thus it is bad for one to forge ahead or to turn aside or to stay behind moving together is absolutely necessary for the happiness of the party once he continued a capable fellow said he would go ahead and wait for us at the foot of a nearby cliff he never reached the cliff while looking for him others of the party scattered and each and all were lost and remained out overnight a little before noon they walked out of the uppermost edge of the woods among the dwarfed trees and distorted groves at timberline an aged and battered forest small and strange they were above the altitude of eleven thousand feet while they were resting the guide called attention to the abundance of paintbrush variously called the painted cup and indian paintbrush which was growing nearby digging down to the roots of this plant parasite he said you will find the roots of one specimen clasped over the roots of another of course its parasitic habits have given in part the form to its leaves and bracts the mountain climbers at once asked for stories about the character and habits of other flowers and of trees beyond them on the edge of an arctic moorland lay a snowfield about two blocks long it appeared somewhat like uncut marble stained with rock dust inlaid with wind-blown beetles and grasshoppers 
its granular material lay melting in the sun a bright flower border encircled it it was made up of flowers of many kinds and colors flowers with and without perfume flowers dwarfed and flowers on tall stately stalks in small compass were a variety of soil moisture and temperature conditions the soil along the upper edges of the snowfield was coarse and dry below fine and moist each species of plants was occupying the peculiar place in which it could best flourish or from which it could exclude competitors it was determinism conditions determining the distribution it probably is true that many of these flowers were developed around the arctic circle the guide recounted the great ice age story how plant and bird and animal life had been swept southward by the irresistible slow-moving glacier on the mountains the seeds grew found a home so to the ptarmigan its condition somewhat similar to the old homes in the arctic in this new colony these birds and flowers still maintain the traditions of their respective old families i am disappointed in finding bird life so rare said one man of the party i have seen only one bird this morning the guide remarked that he had seen at least twelve species of birds and that directly before them at that moment were three species in plain sight why had he seen but a single bird his eyes had not been trained to see a day with a nature guide may help to train the eyes and all the senses a picnic party usually does much talking and more eating a sightseeing party often does things by the book and talks by comparison a botany or a birding party is absorbed in details but a nature guided party is vastly different from these all of the party have a broad outdoor interest they are not in a hurry they are in a mood to be human they make intimate friendships while getting acquainted with nature one day's companionship in the wilds often better acquaints people with each other than years of ordinary association the members of a nature guided party take on a wider happier outlook all are glad to be living the bighorn or wild mountain sheep was seen at close range why these animals live in the heights among the peaks the year round is a story that ever stirs their scene commanding wild environment has exacted of them alertness positiveness sharp eyes and the ability to play safely where there is much space and little substance beneath them the interest in the lives of these vigorous animals were ever spontaneous this like all other subjects was kept well out of the category of weights and measures everything that might have been told about the dissected animal was left unsaid dry bones were not measured nor the scientific name from the tomb of dead language mentioned knowing the way is now a minor guiding necessity mental development and character are the essentials of a successful guide he needs to have a wide range of knowledge and to be capable of tactfully imparting this directly and indirectly the world is beginning to appreciate the necessity of an outside interest fortunate is the individual who has a nature hobby such an interest is known to improve health lengthen life and increase efficiency an excursion with a nature guide may give an individual a new or a better hobby each person receives a chapter in a natural history story that makes him eager for other chapters which he may find anywhere outdoors dr liberty h bailey strikes the keynote i think of nature guiding at a number of points in his the nature study idea at one place in this he says i like the man who has had an incomplete course a partial view if truthful is worth more than a complete course if lifeless 
if the man has acquired a power of work a capability for initiative and investigation an enthusiasm for the daily life his incompleteness is his strength how much there is before him how eager his eye how enthusiastic his temper he is a man with a point of view not a man with mere facts this man will see first the large and significant events he will grasp relationships he will correlate later he will consider the details timberline what determines it and the species of trees that compose it beavers their part in conservation and their influence on the settlement and exploration of america parasitic plants the story of soil the birth life and death of a lake the home territory of animals wind the great seed sower are some of the many possible interests of the trail a few people for years have practiced nature guiding occasionally it has made good and it has a place in national life it carries with it health mental stimulus and inspiration recently nature guiding was given a definite place in the national parks by the government licensing a number of nature guides to conduct people through the wilds nature ever is liberalizing and the nature guide is one of the forces moving for the newer education and for the ideal of internationalism nature guiding is not like sightseeing or the scenery habit the guide sometimes takes his party to a commanding viewpoint or a beautiful spot but views are incidental the aim is to illuminate and reveal the alluring world outdoors by introducing determining influences and the respondent tendencies a nature guide is an interpreter of geology botany zoology and natural history this guide listened courteously to those who wanted to display their own information even to those who indulged in nature faking or told stories that were whoppers but he carefully avoided following their example local natural history he often related and he was sure of an interested audience for everyone enjoys local color and is glad to have past incidents brought to life he was a true guide he had the utmost consideration for those in his care and a quick eye for the interesting and the beautiful he had the faculty of being entertaining instructive watchful and commanding all without his party realizing it he held the climbers together keeping everyone alert and in good humor he is doing a distinct and honorable work for the world children enthusiastically enjoy a day with a nature guide and fortunate the child who can have a number of these excursions they are thought compelling interest arousing children are led after the manner of old people they must not be talked down to the guide may enter a little more intimately into their joys perhaps making slight readjustments to their tastes as a rule the imagination of children is more readily and definitely fired than that of older people climbing a high peak is an excellent experience for any child a thousand movies of mountain climbers a thousand stories by the climbers themselves weeks in school and numerous other experiences cannot do for the child what one day's effort in the heights will do for him mountain climbing has rare richness which cannot be transferred but which any child may make his own in a day the climb should be made with a nature guide one other individual or child might go along but it would be better for the child to have only the guide to interpret his stirring thoughts a day of this kind will do much for the child's imagination and mental resourcefulness and give a landmark to his mental horizon that will stand out through life in this age of movies it will be a fortunate child who has interest in the fundamentals who is rich through knowing the principles of nature 
an interest in flowers birds animals or geology calls for outdoor excursions for initiative gives breadth of view and is a lifelong resource within the movies will be improved but even at their best they can never do for a child what an outdoor interest will enable him to do more beneficially for himself one day a guide was out with several children under eight years of age they became interested in a double-topped spruce they learned that the original treetop was broken off and that the two topmost twigs then bent upward and raced for leadership they had a dead heat as it were and continued rival leaders during the remainder of the day the children often spotted a double topped tree the cones of trees were noticed and of course the cones of balsam fir caused comment because these stood erect upon the limbs instead of hanging down from them in a small area where a forest fire had swept fifteen years before a few trees survived an examination of two of these revealed old fire scars one of the scars indicated that the tree had been injured by the fire of fifteen years before and by another fire eighty-seven years previous a few young aspens and thousands of young lodgepole seedlings were starting why the lodgepole pines were growing here brought out a discussion concerning the trees that commonly were the first to appear in a cleared or burned over area only a few species of young trees thrived in the sunlight others needed shade in which to start this principle appealed to the children an old seed hoarding lodgepole on the edge of the burned area was surrounded and examined it had borne a crop of cones each year for seventeen years all of these cones unopened clung thickly over its limbs a few days before the guide had led a party of older people over precisely the route followed by these children he had talked to both parties similarly but apparently the children had more deep and lasting enjoyment out of the day who would not be delighted to go with a john burroughs or a john muir to be personally conducted to woods lakes and streams by anyone who bubbled over with stories about birds their home life and their travels chipmunks and their children and all the other stories and secrets of the wilderness it is splendid to have thousands of men women and children coming home each year from their vacations talking of the habits and customs of the animals and plants with which they became acquainted on their enjoyable yet purposeful holidays nature guiding need not be confined to national parks there might well be nature guides in every locality in the land fabre has shown monsters and hundreds of little stirring people cooperating or battling in every growth-filled space city parks and the wild places near cities and villages are available to thousands of people and are excellent places for the cultural and inspiring excursions with nature guides ere long nature guiding will be an occupation of honor and distinction may the tribe increase end of chapter twelve Chapter 13 of The Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We live for the most part in a very iron mask of forms. Our daily ways are at bottom so joyless, so trite, so compulsory, that we must be free and simple sometimes, or we break. Our present world is a world of remarkable civilization and of very superior virtue but it is not very natural and not very happy we need to draw sometimes great draughts of simplicity and beauty we need sometimes that poetry should not be droned into our ears but flashed into our senses 
and man with all his knowledge and his pride needs sometimes to know nothing and to feel nothing but that he is a marvelous atom in a marvelous world frederick harrison chapter thirteen play and pranks of wild folk the plays of wild folk are delightful exhibitions and may frequently be enjoyed by those who wait in the wilderness without a gun knowing that wild folk play and that they have a home territory brings them strangely close to ourselves life in the wild places is not all struggle not all hunger fright and fighting all wild animals find time to rest and all from time to time give themselves up to play they mostly play in silence but a few play noisily the majority join with others to frolic but a number of species play singly teamwork has an important play in the life of many bird and animal species and play appears vital to them all a tumbleweed in a wyoming windstorm furnished the plaything in an exciting game for a pack of wolves i watched the play from the shelter of a ravine flying before the wind the tumbleweed bounded a ridge with a huge wolf leaping after it closely pressing him came a pursuing pack of twenty a lull in the wind and the tumbleweed colliding with the leading wolf's head bounded off to one side other wolves sprang in the air after it but the wind carried the tumbleweed along and the entire pack rushed in pursuit this big much branched ball-shaped weed was two feet in diameter when it touched the earth the gale swept it bounding forward and rolling over and over across the brown wide plains after it came the closely massed wolves just as those in the lead were nearing this animated plaything it was caught by a whirlwind and pulled high into the air two wolves leaped and tried to seize it several sat down and stared after it as though it were gone forever the tumbleweed commenced to descend but buoyed up by the air it came down slowly the pack surged this way and that as the weed surged in descending to be beneath it and while it was still several feet above them a high leaping fellow struck it head on and sent it flying to one side it disappeared in a hollow and the wolves vanished after it puffs of dust and occasionally the high bounding weed itself told me that the game was on as vigorously as ever the next act opened with the reappearance of one of the wolves running up a slope and looking back over his shoulder up in the wind a little behind him and off to one side came the tumbleweed the wolf turned leaped at the weed struck it with his breast and knocked it vaulting away the pack rushing into view swerved as one to seize or strike it each player was intense and all were serious as football players a sweeping gale carried the whirling weed forward again it came in contact with a rock outcrop and rolled to one side the whole team rushed at the weed and tumbled pell-mell about it in this general mix-up two of the wolves started a fight the pack joined in the row struggling and rolling about a pair occasionally clinched reared into the air and fell back the badly mashed tumbleweed with crippling bounces went on with the wind across the wide dust-blown plains suddenly the fight stopped the panting wolves stood a few seconds looking at nothing then scattered the play was over had it started i wondered as unceremoniously as suddenly as it stopped most wild animal players are as solemn as chess contestants and most games are as serious as a football match the characteristic play of the wolf is serious silent teamwork but the dignified independent grizzly plays alone he too romps in silence but joyfully he relaxes and has the time of his life bears appear to excel in light-hearted merry make-believe a grizzly bear coasting on a steep 
mountainside made a picturesque play spectacle he was playing on a summit slope south of long's peak in what is now the rocky mountain national park as he sat down in the snow put his four paws on his knees and jingled himself along to start he appeared strangely human at one point he reached back his paw and put on brakes he ended the coast with a jump and a somersault then selecting a different place on the slope he started down again pushing himself along with both forepaws to get up speed he ended this time by deliberately rolling over and over rising on hind feet he looked at his marks on the snowy slope and climbed back up for another coast twice i have seen a black bear the happy hooligan of the woods and a coyote playing together in one of these games the bear solemn looking as an elephant but as merry as a boy would allow the coyote to leap over him but used his speed and his wits in trying to prevent the coyote from ducking under him or leaping across close in front of him the coyote's play was puppy-like though suggesting at times fox cleverness they were well matched both in skill and speed they made lively dashes and swift turns as they raced across a grassy opening in the woods they varied this swift turning by slow passing biting and striking at each other as they met then each in turn enjoyed the ludicrous pretense of being asleep while the other went through an equally ludicrous pretense of trying to slip up and surprise the sleeper as games often end this play broke up in a row the coyote lost his temper and made a fierce but ineffectual attack on the bear he finally walked off into the woods with the bear standing looking regretfully after him the boy like black bear would rather play than eat once i saw a black bear try repeatedly to get a stupid lumbering porcupine to play with him all the way across an opening he made efforts to start a game but dull porky lumbered on indifferently the porcupine is the only animal that i have known which i have never seen play the black bear will play with bears or with other animals or with people with apparently equal enjoyment in the yellowstone i raced and dodged about with several that were nearly wild to my own entertainment as well as theirs bears play less often with objects but i once watched a make-believe battle which one was having with a stump and on another occasion i saw an older bear with a cone striking it about tossing it into the air trying to catch it as it fell and shaking it in his teeth as he rolled about on his back with feet in the air in most cases neither birds nor animals use playthings but i have seen birds play with sticks stones leaves and nuts an otter play with shells and even using a live turtle for a plaything and a grizzly playing with a floating log rambling through the medicine bow mountains of colorado one afternoon i came upon a grizzly bear sitting on his haunches like a dog and looking with all attention across a beaver pond making a quiet detour through the primeval forest i found that he was watching a number of otter playfully coasting on their slide the smooth slippery wet slide about forty feet long came down the steeply wooded slope into the south shore of the pond the slide was well worn and testified to the strong play habits of these animals each coasting otter ended with a merry splash as he slid into the water the glimpses that i had of the coasters showed that they were all enjoyment the grizzly all the time i watched was giving the otter enthusiastic attention but he was only one of many spectators a flock of wild ducks sat motionless in the pond observing the players the coasting suddenly stopped and the otter disappeared in the water a squirrel on a spruce limb overhanging the slide had also been a wondering spectator of the play 
and with jerky hesitating chatter of a bark expressed his disappointment and disapproval because the performance was ended the characteristic play of coyotes is noisy they have concerts full of howls barks and yelps in ever varying combinations these players have regular places for assembling and both singly and collectively send their wild notes flying at different angles off into the night there are weird ventriloquial effects which sometimes multiply and reproduce one yapping yelping entertainer into a scattered number at other times the howler so transforms his voice that it seems to issue from a point widely separated from the owner but sometimes this clown of the prairie forgets singing to the stars and in silence has games and contests which require speed and skill the humpback whale appears to be the most playful fellow of the seven seas he plays singly with other whales of all ages and he will even play with a ship off the coast of alaska a number of humpbacks were at play near the steamer on which i was a passenger they appeared to have great fun as speedy and as agile as trout they threshed about raced and countermarched one literally stood on his head and with only his tail out of the water beat and churned the waves violently most of all they appeared to enjoy diving then coming to the surface with all possible speed shooting thirty or more feet of their ponderous bodies out of the water and rolling awkwardly to one side as they fell heavily back into the sea the play of the jays and the crows is often fun at the expense of others clark's nutcracker is a rowdy assailing squirrels and precipitating fights between birds of other species he is also a daredevil in flying exhibitions and excels in spectacular airplane dips the long-crested jay is keen-witted and cynical and it seems natural that in playing he should go the limit in rowdyism and the ridiculous and indulge in endless pranks he is strong for vaudeville and farces he likes to impersonate to surprise and to annoy i once saw a number of jays in an exhibition in which each seemed to be endeavoring to outdo the others they skipped and jumped kicked awkwardly caricatured the pose of a stork somersaulted and tried flying from a height with one wing and dropping ungracefully upside down no end of reckless rowdyism and mockery once in the snow on a mountain top i saw a flock of ptarmigan in a strange energetic though silent dance most birds are quiet in their play for sedate and wise old owls surprised me beyond measure with a play that was mostly ridiculous showing off they tried to do a few things absurdly impossible for them to do one of these stunts was chasing their tails and another was high kicking but most of their efforts were more in keeping with their ordinary mien they bowed profoundly they posed in lordly pairs they looked to the right and left with a most aristocratic air they adjusted and readjusted themselves with ceremonious dignity the energetic beaver gives marked attention to play each summer he has a vacation of three months or longer he probably loafs the most of any animal in the wilds he plays much and often and is the master of the fine arts of rest although i have seen mountain lions only a few times when they were not frightened twice i watched them play on one of these occasions the lion was enjoying the pretense of running down an animal and carried out a lively pantomime in the snow frolicking like a kitten one spring day a flock of bighorn sheep found a large snowdrift across their trail on the summit of storm pass they could easily have gone around it but evidently saw here what suggested an excuse to frolic one at a time they started to jump the drift the first performer on gaining the further side turned about to watch the others try it as each jumper landed he quickly lined up with those who had preceded him and faced about to watch the performance while the sheep awaiting their turn 
also gave their close attention as each jump was made the style of jump and the distance covered were much alike in each case most of the sheep made a standing jump two or three backed off several steps and got a running start for the leap one made a clumsy pretense of slipping and came down in the snow on his side two young lambs went together and instead of jumping far jumped high coming down in the center of the drift after the last one had crossed the sheep stood together for a few seconds and then strolled on plainly with nothing in particular to do one day i saw a number of sheep scrambling and circling on an icy slope the fun probably was to keep from falling but it may have been in the falling everyone fell a number of times a few times all four feet shot from beneath a sheep at once and in his sliding a number of rising efforts were made only to result in the sheep's falling each time before it got on its feet again even butterflies play climbers on long's peak sometimes see them floating up the trough often there is an air current flowing up the trough and sometimes this catches hats and takes them with it one calm sunny day i looked down over the summit of the peak and saw a procession of butterflies floating or sailing up the trough on reaching the summit a majority of them dropped down the vertical south wall of the peak about four hundred feet then flew westward and swung in behind a pinnacle where they re-entered the trough near the bottom at a point where an upstanding rock in the trough changed the current there was a lively flapping of wings as though these aviators like boatmen in rapids were tensely concentrated rarely did a butterfly leave the ranks in ascending though in coming down the line was more broken it was a wild region for these fragile winged creatures the first time that i saw them i long watched and wondered what it was all about but after seeing similar exhibitions elsewhere and after watching repeated flights at this place i concluded that butterflies as well as other life play on perfect days butterflies sail over high moorlands and even cross high mountain tops but while sailing on the heights they are ever vigilant for wind the short-lived unannounced gusts would blow their tender wings to pieces in an instant if a dash of wind or sometimes just a cloud shadow comes they fold wings and drop to the earth there they lie motionless until all danger is past yet these frail afraid of the wind people seek out a place of their liking to play high up among the crags i recall once having seen two different plays going on side by side each was a stirring glimpse of motherhood a mother bear lay on her side contentedly watching the cubs as they wrestled boxed each other and occasionally mauled her they were near the summit of the continental divide and all around were scattered snowdrifts and aged storm-battered pines on a nearby cliff were a bighorn ewe and two lambs the lambs were leaping over the mother and playing with each other each wild mother knew of the other's presence but was indifferent with animals as with ourselves play appears to be necessary for the development of the young and for the sustained fitness of the mature as a factor which gives success it probably ranks with food and sleep play drills give development and efficiency play is the nearest approach to the magic fountain of youth distinguished wild folk those alert and quick to readjust themselves to the ever-changing conditions those surviving succeeding and evolving are those ever loyal to life's best ally the youth called play the wonderful story of evolution shows that playing animals are most likely to survive and leave offspring cooperation or teamwork appears to be the outgrowth of team play this is closely allied to mutual aid which is a conspicuous factor in evolution 
and in mutual aid appears to be the beginning of a conscious consideration for the rights of others end of chapter 13 chapter 14 of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain to speak about sparing anything because it is beautiful is to waste one's breath and incur ridicule in the bargain the aesthetic sense the power to enjoy through the eye the ear and the imagination is just as important a factor in the scheme of human happiness as the corporeal sense of eating and drinking but there never has been a time when the world would admit it the practical men who seem forever on the throne know very well that beauty is only meant for lovers and young persons stuff to suckle fools withal the main affair of life is to get the dollar and if there is any money in cutting the throat of beauty why by all means cut her throat that is what practical men have been doing since the world began dr john c van dyke chapter fourteen censored natural history news the ancients went in strong for superstitions both in peace and war these were supposedly for the general welfare the pagan priests in power during the closing days of old rome are said never to have met without laughing over the absurd superstitions which they were perpetuating but one of the greatest victories recorded by a roman admiral was the sinking of a superstition he was about to meet the fleet of the enemy for a decisive battle when the sacred chickens aboard refused to eat this bad omen discouraged the superstitious sailors and even the officers were losing their morale the admiral however promptly threw the chickens overboard with the remark that perhaps they would drink and proceeded to victory a story of modern origin and common circulation has the bighorn mountain sheep dive over precipices and triumphantly land on his horns at the bottom but the bighorn does not know this story and the plan is strange to him the few sheep that may have tried it never return to report results dal deweese the world-wide naturalist and hunter has another sheep story he sat behind a newspaper near a hotel group who were telling hunting incidents and discussing alleged natural history it was too much for him when someone told how the bighorn mountain sheep used their horns for shock absorbers he quietly interrupted with gentlemen i had a bighorn sheep experience near my mountain home walking along the bottom of the deep narrow arkansas river canyon one day a few bits of granite fell at my feet i saw on the upper rim a number of mountain sheep and as i looked up the leader an old ram dived over here dal paused and someone wanted to know what became of the sheep oh said mr deweese he saw me and turned around and went back without a knowledge of natural history a person with a gun is likely to get his wildlife classifications wrong and take a shot at something out of season once i was quietly watching a dignified social gathering of pelicans in a pond when a hunter from the rear took a crack at me he made haste to apologize with the explanation that he mistook me for a goose those who are not up on wilderness etiquette have gossiped most unfairly about the skunk first of all he is ever ready for society his company manners in constant use never mislaid he is well groomed makes no advances unless introduced and he meets visitors face to face the skunk ever acts nicely except when jostled the intruder and the impolite he endeavors to sterilize or screen off with clean chemical spray every wild thing under the sun seems to have suffered from the censorship of nature news geese are supposed to be stupid and loons crazy but both are exceptionally keen-witted the misstatements from which they and the skunk suffer 
satisfy only the censor and some others this censorship of natural history news begun a few generations ago has developed to near exclusiveness of facts those censoring appear wholly unacquainted with their subject and therefore are qualified by censor tests to give the public such selected nature lore as it can be trusted to know and still remain loyal to public institutions a scottish philosopher once said that history is a set of lies agreed upon natural history as it is now censored is an excellent example of the stifling possibilities of censorship a number of people in california and australia have been watching for a frightened ostrich to hide his head in the sand it is possible that a mentally deranged plume bearer may yet be discovered who will do this but it has never been considered good form among the common run of ostriches dan beard in a youthful sketching effort sat down before a flock of florida ostriches they became curious at his general appearance and concentration and two came and looked over his shoulder he has never exhibited the picture possibly it was of an ostrich hiding its lamps ungracefully in a bushel of sand anyway they looked and were agitated but instead of hiding their heads chased dan ingloriously down street they routed him helmet and all equipment were thrown away to aid flight for safety first ever since this experience dan beard has done pioneer work in natural history and has called the nature censor everything but a gentleman going into wild places is too often considered akin to joining the suicide club because wild animals are thought to be ferocious altitude almost as dangerous while storms and lightning make the outdoors a continuous battlefield yet the wilderness is the safety zone of the world it postpones the death of practically all its visitors one of the most encouraging and significant tendencies of the times is the growing distrust of the censor of natural history news he is becoming unpopular and may have to take to the woods and learn something people are responding to the call of the wild in increasing numbers they are going far in wild places returning one hundred per cent fit from top to toe with enthusiastic morale they condemn the mollycoddle doctrine and the evil propaganda of the natural history censors the boy scouts and the campfire girls are endangering the natural history censor these healthy youngsters will give intelligent determinism to future natural history dragonflies will cease being devil's darning needles toads stop producing warts fuzz will have to function otherwise than keeping plants warm in winter if one beaver colony forecasts a hard winter and another in the same locality plans for a mild one both will be allowed to do so uncensored and if porcupines go about the woods throwing their quills like bushmen their boomerangs something will happen to them too with a little more general acquaintance with wildlife and woodcraft there will be an open season on censors prairie dogs live in arid lands for weeks their only water is that from plants eaten there is a story of general circulation which tells that prairie dog holes go down to water oil and artesian wells in prairie dog towns show that the depth of water is from two hundred to five hundred feet a depth impossible for the prairie dog but not for the storyteller although too the chief concern of mrs prairie dog is to prevent snakes eating her young the story goes out that snakes prairie dogs and owls live happily in the same hole roosevelt has commented on the superstitions concerning the alleged ferocity of american animals in general and the mountain lion in particular he brought forward first-hand experience and an array of competent witnesses to show that the lion or puma 
does not leap from tree limbs onto people that it is an extremely shy animal and that one is as safe sleeping in its territory as among tame cats and he might have added much less likely to be disturbed the fear of snakes sharks and devil fish probably has sentenced more people to close confinement than is commonly known it discourages views afoot the devil fish has been the villain of ten thousand adventure stories yet it does not seek human prey the shark too is a magical find for many an inaccurate scribbler snakes are not so big nor so bad nor so common as nursery news proclaims there are two evil and impossible snake stories that appear to have circulated for generations in asia europe africa and america at present they are infesting the tourist routes in south america as thickly as snakes a booze nightmare one of these stories has a snake so large that he swallows an ox tail foremost and comes to grief when the long outpointing horns are reached this story is sometimes varied by describing a snake with the shoulders body and horns of an ox and a tail more than one hundred feet long the most stretched snake skin ever exhibited was only twenty five feet long some years ago an alleged sea serpent made in germany was exhibited to crowds in the capitals of europe taking the skull of one and most of the bones of several ancient zeuglodons the inventor multiplied the real length and exhibited the combination as one one hundred and fourteen foot skeleton sea serpents if they ever existed are extinct but the petrified man too still draws crowds although no petrified man has ever been found the wolves of the united states have not been ferocious for generations if ever so their keen senses are ever alert to avoid coming close to people and in keeping out of sight yet a number of times each year telegrams appear in the newspapers telling of an attack of wolves on people such accounts discourage outdoor life and help keep natural history safe for hypocrisy the following was printed in a newspaper in february nineteen nineteen wolves are attacking children on their way home from school in my country and have treed people keeping them in trees all night they attack men and are killing sheep cattle and hogs one man recently saved his life by killing a wolf after it had jumped into a sleigh in which the man was riding the cow for story purposes is more picturesque than the grizzly bear how interesting it might be if someone would write a story of the capers of a cow that chased strangers up trees then climbed after them such a story might be justified as a work of art and the author honored as a clever entertainer but the fact remains that neither the cow nor the grizzly bear climbs trees working like a beaver is a proverb sometimes applied to people with compliment intended it is interpreted to mean great industry working all the time and overtime but not necessarily accomplishing anything or having a goal the life of the beaver is rich in edifying material but the preachments and the morals concerning his life appear to have been made mostly by censors and professional uplifters without the golden facts their pointing to the beaver for lessons and teachments in the world of nature would not be so bad if they called attention to actualities the beaver ever has a purpose he never works unless he has to do so this is possibly one day out of seven he is efficient and although his accomplishments are monumental he is a master of the fine art of rest a dozen scouts and leader camped last winter for a week in the mountains they tried to discover what the groundhog did on groundhog day would the groundhogs mindful of their vast responsibilities come forth or thrust out their heads to announce the weather for the next sixty days 
the scouts were in the woods owned by the father of one of the boys who knew the location of many groundhog holes twelve of these were marked and watched four holes were drifted over sealed with snow but mr groundhog did not break a seal five others were partially filled with snow but evening came and this snow received not a track the hibernating hog hibernated on at two of the other holes nothing showed up but mid-afternoon cheering in the direction of the third caused twelve scouts quickly to collect a cottontail rabbit had put out his head looking toward every point on the horizon and at the sky and then had gone back for these boy scouts the weather will hereafter have to be regulated without a groundhog perhaps some day the scouts will look into prairie dog holes the object of the censor seems to have been to keep people indoors to keep them from knowing the facts about natural history and the outdoors it is but little less than a crime to attempt to suppress a normal child who has become restless through indoor life by telling him that bears eat bad children bears never eat human flesh nor are bears ferocious bears like all strong and desirable citizens are constantly assailed with attempts at character assassination people who are constantly maligning the bear probably do not have anything against him but he simply is their favorite factor for trying to accomplish a purpose through fear they believe people can be frightened into doing what indoor folk consider good like staying indoors and other debatable conventions punishments and threats were in vogue during the dark ages when education was discounted and kings and powers that be sought service and servility however there appears to be an open season on superstitions ghosts are almost exterminated witches on broomsticks will need to watch their way where liberty motors fly many alleged man-eating monsters and monstrosities are already as dead as dinosaurs the increasing numbers of wildlife reservations and the enlarged numbers of people who have met bears and wolves face to face will ere long cast animal superstitions and the divine right of kings into the scrap heap of models that have had their day many wild animals appear to have courage conscience and common sense often they triumph over the unexpected quickly they readjust to new conditions sometimes they welcome reform and often they cooperate and combine for the general welfare why make the wilderness a fearful place full of ferocious beasts and dangerous forces no nation has fallen for fostering outdoor life indoor excesses have covered the outdoors with superstitions and closed doors against the enjoyment of invigorating storms and snows every season has its advantages forgetting that change and winter of temperate zone give vigor and courage to the race the exclusive indoor people have missed and lost much that is good the changes that challenge and compel growth and keep us fit and growing these give the required and necessary morale for those in life's front ranks at times the old acquaintance has been stern but it raised and conducted our distinguished ancestors to us and for those who don't forget there is renewed health and hope the world is young once more the wild wonderlands give to every child that guiding and glorious light imagination wild nature is the child's greatest heritage unfortunately superstition and system do not know this shining heritage and this wondrous light many a child will never see mother said a small boy as they stood before the leopard's cage how can that animal afford a coat like yours this childish remark is akin to the lofty condescension sometimes observed in the comments concerning the rural population people without knowledge allege inferiority in rural folk country folk and the farmer are thought to be in need of uplift 
and old magazines many wilderness camping places are devastated as though by war trees are burned and hacked birds shot and frightened and wild flowers uprooted these atrocities are committed by those who have a low estimate of poetic wild nature of everything and everybody beyond the city's limits but these people are not to blame their early nature information was misinformation the scouts are already showing that nature censorship is in class a of non-essentials much of roosevelt's power came from the early that is correct acquaintance with nature it furnished him recreation and enjoyment and efficiency and it also stored his mind with inside facts which ever were helpful in making the right decision and in getting results some years ago a lumber company endeavored to acquire a large block of timberland from the government president roosevelt doubting either the character of the timber or desiring to reserve the area denied the application later he reopened the case and the manager of the company came on for the final statement during the discussion the manager exhibited photographs alleged to be of the tract in question the leading photograph was marked engelmann spruce on southern slope of granite mountain altitude seven thousand feet roosevelt at once asked concerning the accuracy of the legend the manager doubly assured him of its absolute accuracy roosevelt knew spruce and other tree habits and habitants in the locality represented and realized that the engelmann spruce was found mostly on cool northern not warm southern slopes and at an altitude of nine thousand feet or more and not as the legend said at seven thousand feet people are made in their leisure hours it is insidious enemy propaganda which discourages the best use of leisure hours outdoor exercise and encourages indoor functions as the conventional thing functions have been tried by many people who have ceased to be fit to have morale and by many a nation which no longer has a place in the sun end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain american schools have as a matter of fact failed to train the great mass of the children for successful earning of a livelihood in the american world of today and at the same time they have failed for the most part to inspire the children with the tastes ambitions and aspirations which would guide them to a sensible and enjoyable use of their leisure dr charles w elliott chapter fifteen harriet little mountain climber little harriet peters a six-year-old friend of mine was listening intently to the comments of the climbers whom i had just guided to the summit of long's peak they were describing their trip to a number of others presently harriet turned to me and asked what birds and animals lived on the top of this high peak of the rockies often i had been asked what could be seen from the top of the peak many people were curious about the size of the summit most interested climbers wanted to know how long it took to go up and back but never before had anyone asked what lived there when the mountain climbing discussion ended this little girl very soberly asked if i would sometime take her to the top of long's peak yes i replied just as soon as we feel that you can go up and back easily it is a long steep climb then she wanted to know is it uphill all the way i had early become interested in harriet she was so alert so quiet and always so cheerful and wide awake she often went off alone to climb the nearby trails or for a ride on her burrow 
of course she enjoyed playing with the other children though she had never been to school she had learned to read and every day out of doors she appeared to be learning new things she was constantly surprising me by asking a lively and original question which showed that she saw many of the interesting things around her and wondered about them how do beavers sharpen their teeth she asked one day we had returned a few hours before from a visit to a beaver colony where we had seen a number of large dead trees whose hard wood showed the marks of the beavers gnawing harriet really wanted to get on top of long's peak she was curiously thoughtfully interested in the things to be seen on the summit of this rocky snowy landmark that towered so grandly fourteen thousand two hundred and fifty five feet into the sky although i had never taken any one so young i was eager to go up with her one autumn day just after harriet was eight years of age we went up we started off on horseback the trail begins in a mountain valley nine thousand feet above sea level the peak rises into the sky one mile higher after galloping a short distance we walked our ponies so that they might breathe for a stretch before taking another gallop harriet wanted to know why it was we slowed down when we might have galloped to the steeper part of the trail why i tightened the saddle cinches also called for an explanation a person who walks with a loose shoe receives a blistered foot and a horse ridden with a loose saddle receives a blistered back i told her most of the time harriet was silent observing and thoughtful but occasionally she asked a definite question about the things nearby she was interested in the new and unusual objects along the way the lodgepole pine perhaps because of its name caused her to ask many questions she wanted to know if arkansas pine such trees as she saw in her arkansas home also lived in the rocky mountains she asked the name of the trees growing in groups near the lively brook along which we were riding these were young balsam fir trees and the purple cones that stood upon the topmost limbs not far above her head attracted her attention she had remembered hearing that up the mountainside there were species of trees that did not live in the valley and that at the timberline where the forest edge is furthest up the mountain lived still other kinds of trees while traveling westward in a canyon i pointed out the scattered limber pines growing on the north wall in the sun and the dense tall growth of engelmann spruce on the shady opposite wall she was interested that these two kinds of trees were living so close together and yet one species kept on the warmer drier side of the canyon and the other on the cooler moister slope while the firs grew only along the stream we saw a number of chipmunks eating the scarlet berries of the low-growing kinnikinick they allowed us to ride close to them and appeared so tame that harriet asked if we had time to stop would they let me play with them like the chipmunks around your cabin the night before had been stormy on the upper mountain slopes harriet was surprised that there were a few inches of snow here and none down below she was riding ahead that she might better see the fresh tracks of the birds and animals in the trail there were many rabbit tracks clean cut and splashed it looked as though they had had a game suddenly my pony bumped into harriet's who had stopped and turned to ask have some barefooted children and their mother been up the trail this morning a line of big tracks came out of the woods on the left and followed the trail up the mountain how strangely like the tracks of barefooted children and an old person the tracks of a mother bear and two cubs slowly quietly not even whispering we rode up the mountain hoping to see them we were scolded by a pine squirrel 
for moving so cautiously we saw where the bears had eaten blueberries in the snow but there were no bears at timberline eleven thousand feet above sea level all of the trees were small yet they did not look like young trees but appeared aged storm-beaten and strange many of them really were hundreds of years old yet so tiny that harriet could reach to the top of them many were not so tall as she my doll would like to climb them but they are too small for me to climb she said we tied our ponies and rambled along this strange edge of the forest there were pines firs spruces dwarfed birch and aspen and arctic willow why harriet asked do these little people live up here on the cold mountainside magpies camp birds and clark's nutcrackers were numerous having a nutting picnic all were having great fun but the nutcrackers were getting most of the nuts pecking holes in the pine cones and busily eating the large almost ripened fruit and calling noisily one of the camp birds alighted upon harriet's shoulder curious to know if she had something for him to eat they are perhaps the most sociable and the best known birds in the western mountains about nine o'clock the sun came out and the snow began to melt the remainder of the day was calm and warm no air stirred on the arctic moorlands above the timberline we watched carefully hoping to see the bighorn we did not see even the track of one but we came upon a flock of ptarmigan these birds had already laid off most of their light brown summer clothes and were dressed in almost pure white the last three miles of the seven steep winding miles to the summit are entirely above the limits of tree growth among rocky crags and old snowfields with most of the trail over either solid or broken rock on boulder field five miles from our starting point we tied our ponies to rocks in the shelter of large boulders and continued upward on foot harriet was a sure-footed climber as we started across this mile stretch of glacial moraine i told her that expert mountaineers travel slowly always look before making a step and stop for talking and looking around occasionally we rested and sometimes we lay down upon a flat boulder and thoroughly relaxed at about thirteen thousand feet while we were thus resting there came a strange chirpy squeak harriet heard it repeated a number of times before asking what it was presently a little animal resembling a rabbit somewhat but more nearly like a guinea pig ran in front of us carrying in its mouth a few blades of coarse grass and one or two tiny arctic plants it was a mountain coney was he squealing because something bit his ears off harriet asked the coney's short ears do appear as though clipped i told her that the coney is called the haymaker of the heights each autumn he gathers small haycocks of plants and stores them among the boulders for his winter food why doesn't he go down the mountain and live by the brook where there is more hay was another question that i could not answer about a thousand feet below the top of the peak we turned aside for a drink from a tiny spring the last water on the way up here we lingered several minutes Harriet gathered a double handful of snow and carried it to the spring that she might send more water down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Then of the wet snow she made a dam on the rocks where the water flowed from the spring. Leaving this place we did steep rock climbing over a few hundred feet to the narrows. In places Harriet walked in front of me but most of the time she was behind and always close by listening carefully i could tell that all was well with her without looking back at no time were we roped together in a few places i helped her 
but most of the time she walked alone. A few snowdrifts and ice piles remain on the head and shoulders of the peak all summer. The upper 2,000 feet is almost solid rock. There are cracks, ledges, and shattered places for the pinnacle and shattered rock around its base. Here and there was a beauty spot, a tiny bed of soil covered with grass and flowers in the midst of the rocky barrenness. From the narrows, a little below the summit, we saw two eagles soaring and circling about in the air two or three thousand feet above us. A few times their shadows dashed by us. The narrows is a ledge, a shelf-like stretch of the trail on the edge of a precipice. There is no banister here, but one is needed. Many grown people have stopped at this point but Harriet walked across without saying a word. Up the home stretch, the last climb to the top, the slope is extremely steep and the rock solid. Here many people call out safety first and go up on all fours, but Harriet, who was in front of me, walked up, swinging her arms and humming softly to herself. We arrived at the summit of the peak a little after twelve o'clock, five hours from the time we started. The broken summit surface is nearly level and strewn with slabs and angular chunks of pink granite, from sand and coarse gravel up to blocks several feet across. The instant we stopped on the top, I said to Harriet, Now you are here. What do you think of it? She stood for nearly a minute, looking around without saying a word, and then asked, Where did all the rocks come from? Harriet was surprised to find the top so large. There was just about room to give all the players in a baseball game a place to stand with the batter, first baseman, and outfielders all standing on the edge. We walked around the top keeping close to the edge. In most places it dropped off steeply for a hundred feet. The east side is a perpendicular wall more than a thousand feet high. There were many cracked and loose stones on the edge. Many were almost ready to fall overboard, as numerous others had already done. Plainly, the top of the peak had once been much larger. Just as we were sitting down to eat our lunch, Harriet asked, How big was the top once? We sat in a safe place near the edge of a precipice where we could look down into Chasm Lake, a glacier-made basin 2,000 feet below us. The water, though clear, appeared as green as any emerald ink you have ever seen. A half-tamed groundhog that in summer lived upon the summit came forth to have scraps of our lunch. A flock of rosy finches alighted near us. A hummingbird flew over without stopping. A number of butterflies circled about in the calm, sunny air. Harriet asked if there were always the same animals on the summit. I told her I had seen bighorn sheep tracks and mountain lion tracks there. Just once, when I was up with another little girl, I had seen a cottontail rabbit on the top, but I could not understand how he came to be there. Bluebirds, robins, ptarmigan, eagles, and weasels sometimes come to the summit. We looked at the many colored lichens upon the rocks and at the green leaves of the purple primrose and the stalks of the yellow avens. They were growing in little patches of sand between rock slabs. Harriet asked where the plants and the mountaintop birds came from. I told her that a number of the same plants and animals were found in the far north around the Arctic Circle. At one time, many thousand years before, the Ice King had sent his glaciers a few thousand miles from the north, driving Arctic plants down on the moving ice and ptarmigan in front of it. These plants and birds had made their home on the mountain tops and remained after the ice melted away. 
harriet's aunt had told her that the alps are much older and snowier than the rocky mountains no one lives as high in the alps as the mountain valley where we were living timberline the forest edge is at six thousand five hundred feet there and no plants or birds live above the altitude of nine thousand feet as we stood for a moment before beginning the descent harriet turned and looked silently at the far distant magnificent views to the north south east and west not a question was asked and i have often wondered what impression they made upon her after having a little more than an hour on the top of the peak we started slowly homeward when a little below the altitude of twelve thousand feet we dismounted and searched among the boulders for the columbine luckily we found a beautiful specimen with its silver and blue petals waving on a slender stalk that stood several inches higher than harriet's head the columbine is the state flower of colorado having been selected by a majority vote of the school children and is mentioned for our national flower harriet looked again and again at the strange little trees at timberline and watched eagerly for the bears we talked about the things we had seen she asked many questions about the trips other climbers had made and i told her of experiences on rainy days on snowy days and on wintry days she was most interested in my moonlight climbs and wished she might sometime go up at night of the two hundred and fifty odd trips which i have made as a guide to the summit of this great old peak the trip with harriet is the one i like best to recall and i am sure too should harriet live threescore and ten years she will remember the day of her successful climb to the summit of long's peak this climb as i remember was in september nineteen o five some years later i heard that harriet was graduated from a girls college in texas i often wonder what has become of her end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain three years she grew in sun and shower when nature said a lovelier flower on earth was never sown this child i to myself will take she will be mine and i will make a lady of my own myself will to my darling be both law and impulse and with me the girl in rock and plain in earth and heaven in glade and bower shall feel an overseeing power to kindle or restrain she shall be sportive as the fawn that wild with glee across the lawn or up the mountain springs and hers shall be the breathing balm and hers the silence and the calm of mute insensate things the floating clouds their state shall lend to her for her the willow bend nor shall she fail to see even in the motions of the storm grace that shall mould the maiden's form by silent sympathy the stars of midnight shall be dear to her and she shall lend her ear in many a secret place where rivulets dance their wayward round and beauty born of murmuring sound shall pass into her face wordsworth chapter sixteen the evolution of nature guiding the primeval guide led his followers along the dim wildlife trail marked by hoof and claw primitive folk needed to find the way back to camp and to lead their associates to a discovered feast wood lore and the peculiar alertness which commonly goes with it made every indian a born guide the indian took reckonings as he moved and once over a route he knew its landmarks and its resources 
lewis and clark in two emergencies were guided by sacagawea a sixteen-year-old indian girl who might be called a nature guide her mastery of the outdoors enabled her to lead the exploring party across the rocky mountains to places she had not been before kit carson and john coulter were excellent guides guides have encouraged people to go into new fields among new scenes to advance to get somewhere macmillan in four years in the white north tells of a rare incident which illustrates the mastership of man over the obstacles of nature and the ability to use its resources the thermometer was thirty-six below and a blizzard had been roaring for hours when several sledge loads of eskimos pulled up merrily in front of macmillan's camp the eskimos were bound for two or three days journey into the north where they hoped to live off the country and carried only a few pounds of food and a little oil upon their sledges they were real explorers remarked macmillan the nature guide finds treasures to right and left for his followers in territory which to most people appears barren the mention of a guide usually suggests an expert alpine or canadian peak climber a hunting guide in the north the west or africa an individual who can ride shoot cook a meal pack a horse and guide a hunting party to its goal swiss guides are justly famous for their skill and their bravery on icy storm-swept precipices and for their patience and endurance in overcoming the dangers and obstacles that beset the way of those who climb into the sky only a few people are physically fitted to follow the swiss guide and on the whole peak climbing is a physical triumph it is well worth while and is certain to continue but nature guides offer natural history excursions more intellectual in their nature which may be enjoyed by almost everyone natural history has been incidental to all previous types of guides while to the nature guide it is the essential feature of every trip the hunter's chief aim is to find and kill the bear while that of the nature guide is to watch the ways of the bear and to enjoy him several years ago in an editorial story in country life in america i called attention to our need of outdoor guides capable of arousing more interest in natural history in 1916 i discussed the same idea guides wanted in the saturday evening post the type of guide wanted is the nature guide nature guides are still needed but as yet there is no regular place for his training while i have trained a few nature guides there appears to be a need for the state university or a foundation regularly to develop nature guides it is probable that nature guiding will become a nationwide and distinct profession and though different rank with the occupations of authors and lecturers a nature guide is a naturalist who can guide others to the secrets of nature every plant and animal every stream and stone has a number of fascinating facts associated with it and about each there are numberless stories beavers build houses bears play birds have a summer and a winter home thousands of miles apart flowers have color and perfume every species of life is fitted for a peculiar life zone the why of these things how all came about are of interest touched by a nature guide the wilderness of the outdoors becomes a wonderland then ever after wherever one goes afield he enjoys the poetry of nature this wonderland may be enjoyed around the world forever wild birds sing wild flowers bloom wherever streams ebb upon the sand or the seasons show their pictures almost every locality has its old tree its rare plant its striking bit of geology 
what natural history treasures are in the wild places of your locality it would be a happy experience for any individual either alone or with others to make a nature survey of his locality with the idea of doing nature guiding or trail school work during each summer vacation a number of individuals are enriching their lives by getting intimately acquainted with the birds animals and trees of the locality visited a nature guide in every locality who around his home or in the nearest park could show with fitting stories the wild places birds flowers and animals would add to the enjoyment of everyone who lives in the region or who visits it before we realize it there will be municipal and private nature guides in every city park official and private nature guides in state parks and in the national parks nature guiding is a splendid opportunity for young men and young women it is a worthwhile life work and one that will add immeasurably to the general welfare of the nation we have been practicing first alone and then with assistance the principles of nature guiding for some years in what is now the rocky mountain national park we hear that there are plans to use some form of nature guiding in both the yosemite national park and the palisades interstate park the following slogans have grown out of our applications of nature guiding at longs peak colorado they have interested many people and have helped extend the idea a child learns only when he is thinking and nature's wonders compel him to think every child asks questions the nature guide answers questions intelligently and thereby brings forth other intelligent questions a nature room in every home contains photographs nature books and geological specimens this would be a help in education adventure for old and young trail schools trail schools always in session day and night summer and winter rain and shine trail schools train the senses the most important part of education has always been through the senses dr charles elliot entertain your guests at home by a trip with a nature guide boost for trail schools in every city park the few high-class nature guides whom i have known had versatility and a background they were not only masters of their own localities but had a good knowledge of the whole outdoors they had camped and could tell others how to camp had the resourcefulness to appreciate nature under all conditions moonlight and starlight in rain and snow and could impart that pleasure to others were masters of woodcraft knew how to build and to extinguish a campfire and how to select a campsite understood horses and the packing of a pack horse the ways and means of making their parties safe and comfortable their knowledge of first aid their vigilance in prevention of accidents and their mastery of the trail all became so much a matter of second nature that they were able to give all thought and energy to interesting their people in the natural history features they had a quick eye for the interesting the unusual and the beautiful they could use a camera the nature guide who understands human nature and possesses tact and ingenuity and is able to hold divergent interests and scattering members of his party together he appreciates too the eloquence of silence and is skillful in controlling directing and diverting the conversation of members of his party lest the beauty of the outdoors be marred by lack of discrimination of someone he is master of the art of suggestion he is a leader rather than a teacher he has control of his party so that he may entertain instruct and command without their being aware that he is ruling with a hand of iron when the best results of the trip demand it good outdoors books are a part of the nature guide's equipment and he is able to introduce others to good nature literature 
and many of the eloquent nature lectures and much of the outdoor literature of the world may in the nature of things be produced by nature guides it is not necessary for a guide to be a walking encyclopedia he does not need to impose theories from printed authorities nor to consider nature books infallible but a knowledge of the leading nature and scientific books should be a part of his equipment and may become a part of the enjoyment of those whom he interests and also the nature guide should know shakespeare and many of the great poems a nature guide is not a guide in the ordinary sense of the word and is not a teacher at all times however he has been rightfully associated with information and some form of education but nature guiding as we see it is more inspirational than informational vigilance in discouraging the picking of wild flowers is essential in any guide the nature guide arouses interest by dealing in big principles not with detached and colorless information he illustrates the principles of pollination evolution glaciation migration of birds mutual aid and the fundamental forces of nature wherever he goes he deals with the manners and customs of birds and animal life the determining influences of their environment and their respondent tendencies rather than with their classification he creates more permanent interest in the biography of a single tree than in the naming of many trees fortunate the individual who has nature for an outside interest a well-known new york lawyer specializes during vacations on animal life any animal horse chipmunk or dog this he watches and enjoys it is well for each outdoor individual of limited time while satisfying a general interest to specialize on some one thing a guide also may specialize but when he is out with a miscellaneous party he needs to be almost as universal as nature herself in using the wondrous wealth of natural history the nature guide has extraordinary opportunities he can be a mighty factor in helping people to determine how they will best spend their leisure hours people are made and nations perpetuated through the right use of leisure time the following outline is a plan that we have used effectively in arousing interest in many an object it may be adapted and used to fix interest upon any species of tree or plant bird or animal with modifications used in discussing geology the idea of this plan is to give an interesting biography of every object considered its name classification and family being wholly secondary wind and water birds and animals scatter tree seeds give them adventurous transportation in their search for a home most seeds are lost or destroyed if you find an unoccupied place and start to grow their place may be a favorable or unfavorable one a little tree peeps up into the big world and unfolds its leaves it may be eaten by insects or by animals burned by fire trampled out or uprooted a number may be injured and still live on and a few grow on uninjured each year a tree puts on a thin coat of wood on the outside just beneath the bark this coat grows over every twig and limb and the tree trunk a tree grows higher by building at the top a limb on the side that a small boy or girl can just reach will never be any further from the earth as the tree grows larger and larger it may be preyed upon by ants borers beetles and wood lice by gypsy moth and by caterpillars but the chickadees nuthatches and other birds will eat the wood lice and the caterpillars and dr woodpecker will dig in after the borers and beetles 
trees live from forty years to a few thousand years of age and during their long life they stand in one place they cannot travel cannot run away from danger in one place they face storm wind and drought every tree has an adventurous life it is a home for the birds it shelters plants and gives shade and beauty to the world it may bear fruit it may become a flagpole or a ship mast and sail around the world some trees like wet places others dry places some cold climates others hot climates the pollination of trees their evolutionary history their geological records ever are a delight every flower that blooms like every old tree has an adventurous life a brief and stirring biography so too has every piece of red sandstone and every great cobblestone in the lowlands the red stone may once have been a piece of dark granite on top of the snowy peak or the cobblestone may have been torn from a cliff and shaped by a glacier that carried it for a thousand miles or more every handful of soil has a story stranger than any produced in fairyland the above plan can be adjusted and adapted to almost any subject under discussion to have made friends with one tree is better than to have learned the names of many trees to have shared its experiences through the seasons to have watched the play of sunlight through the branches the storms bursting over its head the rain deepening the color of its bark this is to feel the universal kinship of nature whether the tree be in a city park is a lone tree or one of a noble forest realizing that people lose so much through their erroneous beliefs i am trying so to feature the wilderness world that children will early adjust their lives to its splendid influences altitude is helpful no american animal is ferocious nature must be classed as friendly wild animals and birds play frequently and with enthusiasm nearly all species of birds and animals are endeared to home that is they live within the bounds of a local territory and many have a permanent home nothing equals the helpfulness of nature but unfortunately the vast majority of people suppressed by busy and conventional conditions believe the outdoor excursions are uncomfortable and dangerous that altitude is harmful that most wild animals are ferocious that nature and especially the weather is unfriendly that animals are dull beasts led by instinct and are irresponsible wandering gypsies on the whole it is believed that nature has nothing of value to encourage association with it nature guides can help in having nature appreciated at its true worth in cultivating hospitality to change of nature and in welcoming all kinds of weather and each new experience pioneer men and women have in all ages been famed for their alertness and individuality they are keen and alive and they are happy to be living whitman makes the astounding assertion that all grand poems all heroic deeds were conceived in the open air certainly it is true that nature had something to do with the education and the inspiration of many of the great men and women who lived heroic lives who did much to promote the glory of the growing world the magnificent influence of nature is revealed by many poets wordsworth eloquently pictures this in three years she grew william cullen bryant in thanatopsis and shakespeare in many lines especially in the outburst of universal sympathy in king lear's magnificent prayer on the storm wild heath although australia and new zealand were settled chiefly by convicts these convicts under another sun and sky 
with new opportunities and with the many-sided helpfulness of nature quickly developed people as kind alert and unselfish as any upon the globe mother nature is ever ready to train the growing child by using our wonderful national parks or other wild places we may give the boys and girls of today even better nature training than the pioneers received from their environment huxley says knowledge gained at second hand from books or hearsay is infinitely inferior in quality to knowledge gained at first hand by direct observation and experience with nature the poetic interpretation of nature was a prominent factor in the education of helen keller in the story of my life she says for a long time i had no regular lessons even when i studied most earnestly it seemed more like play than work everything miss sullivan taught me she illustrated by a beautiful story or a poem she introduced dry technicalities of science little by little making every subject so real that i could not help remembering what she taught darwin who appears to be the most influential man of the last century was anything but a bookman he met the requirements of school and college with difficulty and with reluctance but field excursions aroused his powers and gave splendid purpose to his life elizabeth caddy stanton as a girl was fascinated with running water moonlight and the mystery and sounds of the night often after the nurse had tucked her in she climbed out on the window sill and sat listening and wondering for an hour or two as a boy humboldt was kept out of school and encouraged to ramble in the wilds thus developing initiative and independence humboldt and lincoln appear to have been chiefly indebted to nature for their vision which they afterward helped realize for the world froebel appreciated the value of natural history material for little children charles g adams perhaps the leading authority on ecology has pointed out the significance of the response of animal and plant life to environment recent museum groups embody the spirit of nature guiding giving the manners and customs the friends and enemies of the wild life the nature study idea by liberty h bailey is the most comprehensive and complete discussion concerning the helpfulness of nature that i have seen his attitude is stated from a number of angles and he strongly commends the poetic interpretation of nature he says the subject nature study is not a formal part of the curriculum and thereby it is not perfunctory and herein lies much of the value in the fact that it cannot be reduced to a system is not cut and dried and cannot become a part of rigid school methods whatever the method the final results of nature teaching is the development of a keen personal interest in every natural object and phenomenon fundamentally nature study is seeing what one looks at and drawing proper conclusions from what one sees nature study is not the teaching of facts for the sake of facts it is not giving information merely the artist and the poet know this world and they do not know it by mere knowledge or by analysis it appeals to them in moods not in details end of chapter 16